Good morning and welcome to the lecture on shock. After you complete this chapter and related coursework, you will have an understanding of the different types and causes of shock, the process of perfusion, the signs and symptoms associated with shock, the application of the assessment process with the shock patient, and the general and specific emergency medical care provided to patients experiencing shock. Under the National EMS Education Standard Competencies for Shock and Resuscitation, you will be able to apply a fundamental knowledge of the causes, pathophysiology, and management of shock, respiratory failure or arrest, cardiac failure or arrest, and post-resuscitation management. Regarding pathophysiology, you will be able to apply fundamental knowledge of the pathophysiology of respiration and perfusion to patient assessment and management. In this chapter, shock, also referred to as hypoperfusion, refers to a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system. In the early stages of shock, the body attempts to maintain homeostasis, which is a balance of all systems in the body. The body does this through compensation. As shock progresses, however, blood circulation slows and eventually ceases. Shock can occur because of medical or traumatic events. Things like a heart attack, a severe allergic reaction, or some type of trauma, an automobile crash, or serious injury, or gunshot wounds. These are all things that can cause a shock event in a patient. As an EMT, you cannot go wrong assuming that every patient is in shock or may go into shock. Always remember that we err on the side of caution. As we talk about the pathophysiology of shock, you need to understand that perfusion is the circulation of blood within an organ or tissue in adequate amounts to meet the cell's current needs. The body is perfused via the circulatory system. The circulatory system is a complex arrangement of connected tubes including arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. There are two circuits in the body, the systemic circulation and the pulmonary circulation in the lungs. The systemic circulation carries oxygen-rich blood from the left ventricle through the body and back into the right atrium. As blood passes through the tissues and organs, it gives up oxygen and nutrients and absorbs cellular waste and carbon dioxide. Perfusion is an important part of the process by which waste products, such as carbon dioxide make, made by the cells, are then removed. Organs, tissues, and cells must have adequate oxygenation or they may die. If oxygenated blood is not properly circulated, some of the cells and organs will not receive proper nutrients, and this may possibly result in cellular death. Diffusion is a passive process in which molecules move from an area with a higher concentration of molecules to an area of lower concentration. Oxygen molecules, for example, move from the alveoli into the blood, and carbon dioxide moves from the blood into the alveoli. If there is a disturbance in the transportation of carbon dioxide, dangerous waste products will then build up in the cells and organs and this will lead to cell or organ death. Shock refers to a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system that leads to inadequate circulation. Like internal bleeding, shock is an unseen life threat caused by a medical disorder or some type of traumatic injury. And to protect our vital organs, the body will attempt to compensate by directing blood flow from organs that are more tolerant of low flow, such as your skin and your intestines, to organs that cannot tolerate low blood flow, such as your heart, your brain, and your lungs. If the symptoms of shock are not promptly addressed, the patient will soon die. The cardiovascular system has three parts, and we have discussed this before. It has a pump, which is the heart, and it is actually a, a double-sided pump. It has a set of pipes, which is blood vessels and arteries that act as the container, and it has the contents of the container or the blood. I often refer to the cardiovascular system as being just like the water system in your home. You have to have some type of pump or pressure. You have to have pipes to carry the fluid, and you have to have the contents or the fluid. great picture of how the cardiovascular system works. So these three parts can be called the perfusion triangle. When a patient is in shock, one or more of the three parts are not working properly. Some of the things to remember, for example, the heart is your pump and damage to the heart by any type of disease or injury does decrease the ability of the heart to function properly as the pump. Therefore, it doesn't move enough blood through the body to support perfusion of tissues. The vessels, the container function, 
If all of your vessels dilate at once, the normal amount of blood volume is not enough to fill the container and provide adequate perfusion to the body. And then the blood, which is your contents, if you do not have enough blood or plasma or you lose a lot of blood or plasma, volume then is decreased and there's not enough to support the needs of the body for perfusion. Blood pressure is the pressure of blood within the vessels at any one time. Your systolic pressure is your peak arterial pressure and the diastolic pressure is the pressure that is maintained within the arteries while the heart is at rest between beats. Blood flow through the capillary beds is regulated by the capillary sphincters, circular muscle, muscular walls that constrict and dilate. These sphincters are under the control of the autonomic nervous system and that regulates involuntary functions such as sweating and digestion. Capillary sphincters also respond to other types of stimulus such as heat or cold, the need for oxygen or the need for waste removal. Perfusion requires more than just having a working cardiovascular system. It also requires adequate oxygenation exchange in the lungs. It requires adequate nutrients in the form of glucose in the blood. And it also requires adequate removal of waste, primarily through the lungs. Mechanisms are in place to help support the respiratory and cardiovascular systems when the need for perfusion of the vital organs is increased. These mechanisms include the autonomic nervous system as well as hormones. They are triggered when the body senses that the pressure in the system is failing. Hormones then stimulate an increase in heart rate and in the strength of cardiac contractions and vasoconstriction in the non-essential areas, primarily your skin and your GI tract. These actions are designed to maintain pressure in the system and as a result, perfusion of all vital organs. The autonomic nervous system and hormones respond within seconds. Next, we're going to talk about the causes of shock. Shock can result from many conditions, including bleeding, respiratory failure, acute allergic reactions, and overwhelming infection. In all of these cases, the damage occurs because of insufficient perfusion of the organs and the tissues. Pump failure. Some of the causes of failure of the cardiac pump is heart attack, trauma to the heart, or obstructive causes. Some of the types of shock that you need to know about are cardiogenic or obstructive. Low fluid volume, some of the causes, trauma to vessels or tissues, fluid loss from the GI tract as a result of vomiting or diarrhea. Remember, this can also lower the fluid component of the blood. And the types of shock normally seen are hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic shock. Poor vessel function, causes include infection, narcotic drug overdoses, spinal cord injury, and anaphylaxis. The types of shock we see here are distributive shock, which includes septic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, and psychogenic shock. We'll first talk about cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is caused by inadequate function of the heart or pump failure. A major effect is the backup of blood into the lungs and the resulting buildup of pulmonary fluid we call pulmonary edema. Edema is the presence of abnormally large amounts of fluid between cells in the body, tissues, causing swelling of the affected area, and pulmonary edema will then lead to impaired ventilation. Cardiogenic shock develops when the heart cannot maintain sufficient output to meet the demands of the body. Cardiac output is the volume of blood that the heart can pump in one minute, and it is dependent upon several, several factors. The heart must have adequate strength which is largely determined by the ability of the heart muscle to contract. This is called myocardial contractility. The heart must receive adequate blood to pump, and the resistance to flow in the peripheral circulation must also be appropriate. The next type of shock we're going to discuss is obstructive shock. Obstructive shock occurs when conditions that cause mechanical obstruction of the cardiac muscle also affect the pump function. Some common examples include cardiac tamponade and tension pneumothorax. Cardiac tamponade is a collection of fluid between the pericardial sac and the myocardium. It is caused by blunt or penetrating trauma and it does progress rapidly. Blood leaks into the tough fibrous membrane known as the pericardium, causing an accumulation of blood within the pericardial sac. This accumulation leads to compression of the heart. Signs and symptoms of cardiac tamponade are referred to as Beck's triad. 
This is the presence of jugular vein distension, muffled heart sounds, and systolic and diastolic blood pressure starting to merge. Tension pneumothorax is caused by damage to lung tissue. The damage allows air normally held within the lung to escape into the chest cavity, and this air applies pressure to the organs, including the heart. The next type of shock we're going to discuss is distributive shock. This results when there is a widespread dilation of small arterioles, venules, or both. The circulating blood volume then pools in the expanded vascular beds and tissue perfusion will decrease. The first of these is septic shock. Septic shock occurs as a result of severe infections that are usually bacterial where toxins are generated by the bacteria or the infected body tissues. Toxins damage vessel walls causing increased cellular permeability. The vessel walls will leak and are unable to contract well. Widespread dilation of the vessels in combination with plasma loss through the injured vessel walls results in shock. Septic shock is a complex problem. There is an insufficient volume of fluid in the container because much of the plasma has now leaked out into the vascular system causing hypovolemia. The fluid that is leaked out often collects in the respiratory system interfering with the ventilatory process. And vasodilation leads to a larger than normal vascular bed to contain the smaller than normal volume in the intravascular fluid. Septic shock is almost always a complication of a very serious illness, injury, or surgery. The next type of distributive shock we're going to discuss is neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is usually a result of injury to the part of the nervous system that controls the size and muscle tone of the blood vessels. Some of the causes include damage to the spinal cord from trauma, brain conditions, tumors, pressure on the spinal cord, and spina bifida. In neurogenic shock, muscles in the walls of the blood vessels are cut off from the sympathetic nervous system and nerve impulses that cause them to contract. All vessels below the level of spinal injury dilate widely, increasing the size and capacity of the vascular system and causing blood pooling. The available 6 liters of blood in the average body can no longer fill the enlarged vascular system. Even though realistically no blood or fluid has been lost, perfusion of organs and tissues becomes inadequate and shock then occurs. Next is anaphylactic shock. Anaphylaxis occurs when a person reacts violently to a substance to which he or she has been sensitized. Sensitization means becoming sensitive to a substance that did not initially cause a reaction. Each subsequent exposure after sensitization tends to produce a more severe reaction. Some of the common causes of anaphylactic shock include injections like tetanus or penicillin, stings like the honeybee, wasps, yellow jackets, or hornets, ingestion of things such as shellfish, fruit, and medication, and inhalations of dust and pollen. Anaphylactic shock can develop within minutes or even seconds of contact with the substance. The signs are very distinct and not seen with other forms of shock. You can see this in Table 10-2. You should note that cyanosis, the bluish color of the skin, is a late sign of anaphylactic shock. You can see here, this is Table 10-2, and it lists the different types of reactions of the skin, the circulatory system, and the respiratory system for anaphylaxis. The last type here we're going to talk about is psychogenic shock. These are the distributive shocks. Psychogenic shock occurs when a patient has had a sudden reaction of the nervous system that produces a temporary, generalized vascular dilation and it results in fainting or syncope. Blood pools in the dilated blood vessels, reducing the blood supply to the brain. When this happens, the brain ceases to function normally and the patient will faint. Life-threatening causes include irregular heart rhythms and brain aneurysms. Some non-life-threatening causes include bad news receipt, experiencing fear, or seeing unpleasant sights like the sight of blood. That's very common. The next type of shock is hypovolemic shock. Probably by far we see this most often. It is a result of an inadequate amount of fluid or volume within the system. There are hemorrhagic causes as well as non-hemorrhagic causes of hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemia also occurs with, several, with severe thermal burns. 
This occurs because the loss of intravascular plasma happens and plasma leaks from the circulatory system into the burned tissues that lie adjacent to the injury. Dehydration, the loss of water or fluid from body tissues can cause or aggravate shock. Fluid loss can be a result of severe vomiting or diarrhea. Respiratory insufficiency. A patient with a severe chest injury, such as a flailed chest or obstruction of the airway, may be unable to breathe in an adequate amount of oxygen. An insufficient concentration of oxygen in the blood can produce shock as rapidly as vascular causes. Certain types of poisoning may affect the ability of cells to metabolize or carry oxygen. Some of these include carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning. Anemia occurs when there is an abnormally low number of red blood cells. It may be the result of either chronic or acute bleeding, a deficiency in certain vitamins or minerals, or an underlying disease process. Well, now we're now going to talk about how shock progresses. There are three stages in this progression. The first is compensated shock. It, this happens when it's early within the shock stage and the body can still compensate for loss of blood. Decompensated shock is the next stage and it is a later stage when blood pressure starts to fall. And irreversible shock is the terminal stage when transfusion is not enough to save the patient's life. With compensated shock in the early stage, stages, the body can still compensate for blood loss. Some of the signs and symptoms of compensated shock include agitation, restlessness, feeling of impending doom, anxiety, altered mentation, weak, rapid, or absent pulses, clammy skin, pallor with cyanosis occurring around the lips, shallow, rapid breathing, shortness of breath, especially if there is injury to the chest, vomiting or nausea, or both, capillary refill of more than two seconds in infants and children, and marked signs of thirst. Decompensated shock is the late stage as we start to see blood pressure falling. The signs and symptoms, as I said, include falling of blood pressure where the systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury or lower in an adult occurs, labored or irregular breathing, ashen, mottled, or cyanotic skin, thready or absent peripheral pulses, dull eyes and dilated pupils, and poor urinary output. The final stage, irreversible shock, is the terminal stage, and any type of transfusion will not be enough to save the patient's life. This is why shock must be recognized and treated early in the process. Blood pressure may be the last measurable factor to change in shock. When a drop in the blood pressure is evident, shock has now been well developed. This is particularly true in infants and children who can maintain blood pressure until they have lost more than half of their circulating blood volume. The EMT must use caution when caring for patients who are elderly. You need to keep in mind the following signs of the normal aging process when you manage geriatric patients who may be experiencing shock. The central nervous system often has a delayed response. The cardiovascular system has a variety of changes that result in a decrease in the system's efficiency. The respiratory system has significant changes because of elasticity of the lungs and their size and strength will decrease. The geriatric patient's skin is thinner, drier, less elastic, and more fragile. This provides less protection and thermal regulation. The renal system decreases in function and may not respond well to unusual demands such as illness. The GI system sustains changes in gastric motility that may lead to slower gastric emptying. Treating a pediatric or geriatric patient in shock is no different than treating any other shock patient. You need to provide inline spinal stabilization if indicated. The spinal immobilization is not indicated maintain the patient in a position of comfort. Suction as necessary and provide high flow oxygen via the non-rebreather. Be sure you control bleeding. Maintain body temperature, keep the patient warm, and rapidly transport these patients. You should expect shock in many emergency medical situations. You should also expect shock if a patient has had any one of the following conditions. 
multiple severe fractures, any type of abdominal or chest injury, any type of spinal injury, severe infections, has experienced a major heart attack, or is experiencing anaphylaxis. We're now going to discuss patient assessment for shock. As we've talked about before, scene safety and size up is incredibly important. You need to ensure the scene is safe for you, your partner, your patient, and bystanders. You need to determine the necessary standard precautions and whether you will need additional resources to assist in moving the patients. Mechanism of injury, nature of illness. You need to observe the scene and patient for clues to determine the nature of the illness or the mechanism of injury. Primary assessment. The primary assessment for a patient with suspected shock should include a rapid scan of the patient to determine level of consciousness, identify and manage life-threatening concerns, and determine the priority of the patient transport. You treat according to the ABCs. If there is significant bleeding, whether internal or external, it is an immediate life threat and must be recognized and treated appropriately. You should provide high flow oxygen, which will assist in perfusion of damaged tissues. If the patient is experiencing signs of hypoperfusion, you need to treat aggressively and provide rapid transport to the definitive care facility. You need to request advanced life support as necessary to assist with more aggressive shock management. Form your general impression. You form an initial general impression including the age, sex, signs of distress, obvious life-threatening injuries, abnormal positioning, and skin color. Determine the need for manual spinal immobilization and assess the patient's level of consciousness. If the patient is awake and alert, determine a chief complaint. Airway and breathing. Assess the airway to ensure its patency. You need to quickly assess breathing. You want to inspect and palpate the chest wall to assess for DCAP BTLS. Observe the patient for signs of accessory muscle use. If the patient has an increased respiratory rate, this is often an early sign of impending shock. You need to give high flow oxygen or, if needed, assist respirations with a bag mask device. Circulation. Check for a distal pulse. If there is none, check for a central pulse. Determine if the pulse is fast, slow, weak, strong, or altogether absent. A rapid pulse will suggest compensated shock. In shock or compensated shock, the skin may be cool, clammy, or ashen. If the patient has no pulse and is not breathing, you should immediately begin CPR. Make your transport decision. Determine whether the patient should be treated as high priority, whether ALS is needed, and which facility to transport to. Trauma patients with shock or a suspect, suspicious mechanism of injury generally should go to a trauma center. History taking. You need to investigate the chief complaint and obtain your sample history, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past pertinent history, last oral intake, and events leading up to the in incident. Secondary assessment. Physical exam. If significant trauma has likely affected multiple systems, start with a full body scan to be sure you have identified all injuries. Next, assess the respiratory system and ask yourself the following questions. Is the patient's respiratory rate and quality within normal limits? What is the patient's skin color and condition? Are there any signs of increased respiratory effort, such as retractions, nasal flaring, strider, or the use of accessory muscles? Assess the neurologic system, including level of consciousness, pupil size and reactivity, motor response, and sensory response. Assess the musculoskeletal system by doing a detailed full body scan. You want to look at all anatomic regions, looking for the following. Something like raccoon's eyes, battle sign, or drainage of blood or fluid from the ears or nose, JVD, jugular venous distension, or tracheal deviation, or both. Pelvic stability, tenderness or rigidity in the abdomen, and check pulse, motor, and sensory function in all four extremities. Check vital signs. You need to get a complete set of baseline vitals. If the patient's condition is unstable, or it could become unstable, reassess vital signs every five minutes. If the patient is in stable condition, reassess vital signs every 10 to 15 minutes.
monitoring devices. Use monitoring devices to quantify oxygenation and circulatory status, but these devices should never replace your hands-on assessment. Use a non-invasive technique to monitor blood pressure and a pulse oximeter to evaluate the effectiveness of oxygenation. Reassessment. The first thing we need to do is determine what interventions are needed for our patients and at this point based on the findings of your assessment. Focus on supporting cardiovascular system and providing oxygen and putting the patient in the shock position. Communications and documentation. Patients who are in decompensated shock will need rapid intervention to restore adequate perfusion. Most of the interventions used to treat shock do not require a specific physician's order, however some might. Determine whether your patient is in compensated or decompensated shock and document these findings after you treat for shock. Next, we're going to talk about emergency medical care for the different types of shock. You must begin immediate treatment for shock as soon as you realize that the condition might exist. Skill Drill 10.1 will help you through this process. Never give the patient anything by mouth, no matter how urgently you are asked. If you need to relieve the intense thirst that often accompanies shock, give the patient a moistened piece of gauze to chew on or suck. Never give a patient in shock an alcoholic drink or other depressant. Accurately record the patient's vital signs approximately every five minutes throughout treatment and transport. Table 10-4 lists the general supportive measures for the major types of shock. Next we'll talk about the treatment for cardiogenic shock or pump failure. The patient who is in shock as a result of a heart attack does not require a transfusion of blood, intravenous fluids, or elevation of the legs. Chronic lung disease can aggravate cardiogenic shock and the patient is often able to breathe better in a sitting or semi-sitting position. Usually, patients with cardiogenic shock do not have any injury but they may be having chest pain. The patient may have taken nitroglycerin prior to EMS arrival and may want to take more. Before you assist a patient to self-administer nitroglycerin, you need to consult with medical control for instructions or follow your local protocols. Perform an accurate assessment. Patients in cardiogenic shock usually have a low blood pressure. Other signs and symptoms will include a weak regular, irregular pulse, cyanosis about the lips or underneath the fingernails, anxiety and nausea, or possibly vomiting. Place the patient in a position that eases breathing as you administer high flow oxygen. You should also assist ventilations as necessary and have suction nearby in case the patient vomits. Provide prompt transport and approach a patient who has had a suspected heart attack with calm reassurance. The more calm you are, the better off your patient will be. Treatment of obstructive shock. In a patient with cardiac tamponade, increasing cardiac output should be your priority in treatment of this process. Apply high flow oxygen. The only definitive treatment for cardiac tamponade is surgery. Pericardiocentesis, which involves penetrating the pericardium with a needle and withdrawing the accumulated blood from the sac, is the only practical ALS hospital approach. This procedure is rarely performed in the field Early recognition, along with rapid transporter ALS management, if available, is key treatment for EMTs. With tension pneumothorax, high flow oxygen via non rebreather should be applied to help prevent the patient from experiencing hypoxia. Usually, the only action that can prevent eventual death from a tension pneumo is decompression of the injured side of the chest, relieving the pressure in the chest and allowing the heart to fully expand again. Early recognition, along with rapid transport or ALS management, if available, is the key treatment available to EMTs. Septic shock. The proper treatment of septic shock requires complex hospital management, including antibiotics. Use the appropriate standard precautions and transport as promptly as possible. Use high flow oxygen during transport, and ventilatory support may be necessary to maintain an adequate tidal volume. You need to use blankets to conserve body heat. For neurogenic shock, if the patient has a spinal cord injury, use a combination of all known supportive measures. The patient who has sustained this kind of injury usually will require long hospitalization. Emergency treatment must be directed at obtaining and maintaining appropriate proper airway, 
providing spinal support, assisting inadequate breathing as necessary, conserving body heat, providing the most effective circulation possible. You should keep your patient warm with blankets and transport properly. Treatment of anaphylaxis. Effective treatment for a severe acute allergic reaction is to administer epinephrine via subcutaneous or IM injection. A patient who is aware of having a specific sensitivity may carry a bee sting kit containing epinephrine. Promptly transport the patient. Provide supplemental oxygen and ventilatory assistance and try to find out what agent caused the reaction and how it was received. Keep in mind that a mild reaction may worsen suddenly or over time, and you should consider the request for ALS backup if it is available. Treating psychogenic shock. In uncomplicated fainting, once the patient collapses, circulation to the brain is restored and with it a normal state of function. Psychogenic shock, however, can worsen other types of shock. If the attack has caused your patient to fall, you have to check for injuries, especially if these patients are older. Assess the patient thoroughly for any other abnormalities. If after regaining consciousness the patient is unable to walk normally, you should suspect a head trauma. Transport promptly and record all initial observations of vital signs and level of consciousness. Treatment of hypovolemia. Control all obvious external bleeding. Splint any bone and joint injuries. Secure and maintain an airway and provide respiratory support, including supplemental oxygen and, if needed, assisted ventilations. Be sure the patient does not aspirate blood or vomitus and transport rapidly. To treat respiratory insufficiency, you must immediately secure and maintain the patient's airway. You need to clear the mouth and throat of any obstructions, including mucus, vomitus, and foreign materials. If necessary, ventilate your patient with a VM device and always provide supplemental oxygen and transport promptly. In summary, perfusion requires an intact cardiovascular system and a functioning respiratory system. Most types of shock are caused by dysfunction in the heart, blood vessels, or volume of blood. Shock is the collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system when blood circulation slows and eventually stops. Blood is the vehicle for oxygen transport and nutrients through the vessels to the capillary beds to tissue cells, and these supplies are exchanged for waste products. Blood contains red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and a liquid called plasma. The systolic blood pressure is peak arterial pressure, or the pressure generated every time the heart contracts. The diastolic pressure, on the other hand, is the pressure maintained within the arteries while the heart rests between heartbeats. The various types of shock are cardiogenic, obstructive, septic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, psychogenic, and hypovolemic. Signs of compensated shock include anxiety or agitation, tachycardia, pale, cool, moist skin, increased respiratory rate, nausea and vomiting, and increased thirst. If there is any question on your part, treat for shock. It is never wrong to treat for shock. Signs of decompensated shock include labored or irregular respirations, ashen, gray, or cyanotic skin color, weak or absent distal pulses, dilated pupils, and profound hypotension. Remember, by the time a drop in blood pressure is detected, shock is usually in an advanced stage. Anticipate shock in patients who may have severe infections, significant blunt force trauma or penetrating trauma, massive external bleeding or index of suspicion for major internal bleeding, spinal injury, chest or abdominal injury, major heart attack, or anaphylaxis. Treating a pediatric or geriatric patient in shock is no different than treating any other shock patient. Thank you for paying attention to this lecture. As I said, if you have questions, please always bring them to class to discuss with your instructor.